Yes. <laughs> the recording's in progress. <laughs> okay, well, it's my uh, great distinct pleasure and honor to be able to do, reduce, introduce, gosh, I can't talk, introduce Dr. Larry Crum. Um, uh, Larry was my PhD advisor, also the PhD advisor of Anthony Ashley, our acting dean for another week and a half. Um, and so very happy to have him out here. I was told not to give a long introduction. So I'm just going to let you take it away. <laughs> so if this is a bit of an introduction, I'm going to try to talk about some things in general. Then I'm going to go to things a little bit more specifically. Uh, there's a lot of acoustics in this. Uh, there are probably some people here who have taught their students and their students have forgotten more acoustics than I know. And so I'm talking very in, in, in very general uh, uh, issues at the very beginning, and then I'll get some specificity at the very, uh, toward the end. And so, uh, yeah, this is not going to work. Probably because I clicked on the other screen. You, you have it. Yeah, so this is a bit of an introduction. I've been at the University of Washington for 30 years or so, more than 30 years, although I retired about five or six years ago. University of Washington is a research institution. In terms of funding at a, uh, of federal dollars, the University of Washington and the University of Michigan uh, uh, compete for being number two. It turns out that Johns Hopkins gets more money because they have an NIH program at NIH and they have the APL, which is part of Johns Hopkins and that has a billion dollars of funding a year. But the University of Washington has almost $2 billion of research funding every year and they're very proud of that. I have uh, been at various places. I was, uh, was teacher at the Naval Academy for about 10 years. I was at Ole Miss, uh, the University of Mississippi for another 10 years. And I came to the University of Washington in 1992. And I didn't uh, have no affiliation with any faculty except to be a research professor. And being a research professor just means you can have a title, but we don't give you any money or anything like that. So I started the Center for <clears throat> Industrial Medical Ultrasound after I was there for a few years. And that center was all on soft money. So we got all of our grants and everything and ran the whole program uh, on soft money. And so I'm gonna talk about the kinds of opportunities you can have if you stop working in underwater acoustics or cavitation or something like that, and move into a field that is very broad and has very many opportunities. One of the things that I was able to do is write a proposal to DARPA to build a handheld uh, diagnostic ultrasound machine. The Sonocyte 180, I wrote a proposal to DARPA saying, because one of my friends in the Navy said they had a problem with IEDs in Iraq, this was a long time ago, and uh, how could they find this shrapnel that was in the legs and arms of these soldiers? And I said, you can't use an x-ray machine because uh, plastic, which is made, the, 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 the landmines were made out of, are plastic and that's radiolucent. So uh, x-ray will not see that, but ultrasound did. And so they funded a $12 million proposal and they, with the requirement that I go to a company that can make it. And so I went to a company called ATL, which was in the, in the purchase, it, in the time that we were on this project was uh, sold or sold to Phillips. So Phillips bought the company and they built not the one that we built from our DARPA grant, but they spun off a company called Sonocyte. Sonocyte was purchased by Fujifilm for $990 million, 10 million less than a billion dollars. And I had the first paper on it. I made the proposal. They used my proposal to get their patent and I wasn't allowed to get a dollar out of it because I worked for the University of Washington 
and when wasn't allowed. Uh, signed out. <laughs> Sorry. Can I just click OK? Yeah. If you want to click the X. That means, Clary, don't talk. You know? <laughs> don't do the slides. Let's try to end the meeting. Uh, I just okay. So then, so I, maybe I'll go a little faster. Anyway, the, the remarkable capabilities, you all know doc, diagnostic ultrasound if you're a parent or anything and you've seen your babies. That's the, uh, that is the, the kidney, the, the, the perfusion in a kidney. You know what those are? Gallstones. These are the vessels in a liver. <clears throat> That's a heart valve. Isn't that interesting that you can see a heart valve? And this is a fetus. Maybe we could dim the lights a little bit. I don't know whether we want to do them all the way down. That's great. That's perfect. That is little Bend. We had a graduate student who worked for Phillips at the same time, and he took, he was working on 3D imaging. We took a picture of little Ben who had eight and a half months or something like that. I says a year later, let me see real Ben. There he is. <laughs> and I said, take a picture in profile. So you can do the same thing. And his, his mother said, well, it was his first birthday and he just ate <laughs> Then you, you notice there's a remarkable resemblance. So there are different applications in, in uh, medicine of ultrasound, there's diagnostic ultrasound, and the amplitudes are in order of maybe maximum amplitudes on the order of three or four megapascals. You have a very short time between pulses. They usually use one cycle, and the intensity is 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, let's say, typical. If we use this high intensity focus ultrasound we're gonna talk about is quite different. Longer uh, pulse lengths, longer a delay time or downtime, and then uh, pretty high amplitudes, maybe 12, 15, maybe you can go higher than that. 10 kilowatts, that's five orders of magnitude between diagnostic and high intensity. And then this is interesting, lithotriptors are used to break up the kidney stones. They're cannons. They shoot shock waves, 90 megapascals, but one a second or one every fifth. And now you're down 100 times in diagnostic ultrasound. Diagnostic ultrasound was really started in the 60s, maybe a little bit later than that. There are a lot of people who say that that they were developed at the University of Washington and, and then and people in China says, oh, we did it way before you did. But nonetheless, at the University of Illinois, there was a brothers, a, a Fry brothers, and they were treating disorders of the central nervous system by taking part of the skull off and actually making high intensity focused ultrasound, destroying tumors in the brain in the 1950s. Uh, so therapeutic ultrasound was very old, but was recently adapted uh, in the last, I don't know, 20, 25 years. So here's how we use it. We have a transducer, it's a three-dimensional transducer, focus it on tissue, and it will follow, of course, the way the focal field is. This is a Schlieren example, three-dimensional, and it focuses down, you have a focus, a hot spot, so to speak. And if you use megahertz frequencies, then you can heat the tissue very quickly. So again, this is a replicating, trying these is actually a measurement, this is a real measurement of the field. And now let's take a transducer, focus it non-invasively on an object and see if we can recreate this focus here inside. This happens to be a lens of a cow's eye. And so when the green light comes on, 
I'm going to turn this one. Oops, fine. Now I screwed it up. I got to go back. When the green light comes on, let's count 1,000, 2,000. Within a couple of seconds, you have replicated the focal volume here and you have damaged the tissue. You've cross connected the collagen and other areas. And so now, if this were a tumor, let's say in a person, totally non invasive, you could destroy it. This is caused by temperature. The temperature, it raises to 55 degrees for one second, it will denature proteins. So you can do this in live animals, of course. So for 30 years, we've had a project from NIH to study lithotripsy. And this was a lithotripsy experiment, but we changed it to a HIFU experiment. These are two focused ultrasound therapy transducers that could focus on the kidney. This is a diagnostic imaging system that could monitor it in real time. I lost my movie to show it, but nonetheless, this is basically what happens. This is the imaging system that's seeing a spot in the kidney and the therapy ultrasound systems were co-local or co-registered with the diagnostic system. So they're all looking at this spot here and this, these different colored things means that you're overwhelming the image with the therapy system. And as you look at that focus there, then you can find a destruction or a denaturation of the tissue inside the kidney. And again, if this were a tumor and you had good navigating systems, you could destroy that kidney, the tumor in the kidney. I was uh, I asked to come to China to talk about Haifu. And I was introduced to a company later called China Medical Technologies, and they had this system. And when I started learning about Haifu, I found out that the system was used in China, it already treated 20,000 patients. And let me show you the system. Uh, let me back it up and do it one at a time. They had 251 therapy transducers. I asked why 251, well, that's how much we could fit into this dome here. And they focused this ultrasound down on a patient and they were treating him for pancreatic cancer. And this is 20 years ago. And this person didn't even change his clothes, laid down, exposed his shirt, and they irradiated his uh, pancreas. They didn't kill the tumor, didn't extend his life very much. What they did, they killed all the nerves in the area of the tumor. And if you have pancreatic cancer, usually the last two or three months, you're on opioids because the pain is so much, you just, and, 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 the, and the, the average time after diagnosis and death is six months. These people lived another month longer maybe because uh, you did damage the tumor, but this was, uh, there's a word for it, but I can't remember the word for it, about treating patients for pain. Well, I convinced them to bring the system to the University of Washington. Ju Hao Wong is an MD, PhD. He was my PhD student at the time. He was an MD urologist, and he was an expert in, in pancreatic cancer. And we convinced them to bring the thing to our laboratory and apply for approval from the FDA. And we actually, after two and a half years of doing lots of experiments, we got approval from the FDA to do 12 patients. And then they said, the Chinese medical sense, well, thank you very much for getting approval in the United States. That's gonna help us sell things in China and we won't let you do the experiments in the United States, which was a great disappointment to a lot of us. Here is the, a China medical technology system. Here is a, a pancreas. There's a tumor right there. You might not see, but in the middle of that, there is some, some image, some darkness, and that means that there is flow inside, there's uh, blood flow inside the kidney, inside the tumor. And here, there is no blood flow inside the kidney, which means you've destroyed the whole 
uh, uh, you know, the whole perfusion system, the whole vascular system. And of course, that, that thing will die. And here is a real time of now they are actually, this is a uterine fibroid that they're treating. And this is cavitation. Even though they crank up the amplitude, they crank up the amplitude to get cavitation, they also are going to get an increase in temperature. They're interested in the increase in temperature because you can denature proteins if you brace it up to 55 degrees for about a second. But then the big shots got involved and said, ultrasound guidance, you don't have good enough. Let's do it inside a MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging system, and make an open uh, uh, MR system. You put a patient in it. And now through very complicated work, and a lot of people have done this work, you can measure your temperature in real time to within a degree. And this indicates that there is a temperature probe. And you can also measure how long the temperature has been at that uh, uh, temperature, how long in time, and that will give you a dose. That is, if you have the temperature at 45 degrees for 30 seconds, you do the lab experiments, the animal experiments, you say the tissue is dead. And then afterwards, you can look for perfusion. These are all contrast, MRI contrast things. And you can see that there's no uh, vascularization. That tumor is destroyed thermally, thermally. And these are uh, complicated machines. And this case is treating uterine fibroids. And you can see, if you know how to read these things, there are fibroids inside this person's uterus. And this was the first application of it. And then you can, as I indicated before, you can say that this much tissue is dead inside uterine fibroid. And if uterine fibroids are benign tumors, they just, and all they do is just, you know, they cause a lot of problems. And I could go into it because it's not that important. But if you debulk it, if you kill part of the uterine fibroid, it'll reduce in size. You don't need to, 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 to destroy the whole fibroid. You just need to destroy part of it. And a lot of it will go away if you destroy the vascularization to it. This is a movie about treating essential terminal. I'm just going to turn it on. The volume is not very good. but. Uh, generally, people who have essential tremor start by taking medications to treat their tremor, but very frequently people can't tolerate those medications because of the side effect, and then commonly they don't take away very much of the tremor. MRI-guided focus ultrasound is a new way of treating patients with essential tremor. The procedure is performed in the scanner, and as we're making the lesion, as we're gradually heating up the tissue, we can actually the, see the lesion being made in the patient as we're doing it. So it's real time. We've never had that before. The patients are awake, and we can evaluate them to ensure that we have, are not causing any uh, side effects. What's quite remarkable with this is that we create the final lesion and the tremor stops. These are patients who have had tremor for 10 or 20 years that has just been very disabling. And they look at their hand and they sometimes think, is that really my hand? Well, I think it's just fabulous. I mean, uh, uh, I've done all the different pr surgical procedures for essential tremor, and this is by far the most elegant, safest, and uh, effective way of doing it that I have seen. Okay, this is really important. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, there are thousands of people who uh, have this tremor and, and they, they, can't, they can't pick up things, they can't drink, they have to be fed and everything like that. And it happens to a lot of people. And the reason for it is in the hypothalamus, there is an area that, in which the nerves connect with the motor nerves that, the, 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 sort of that's where they all kind of fit together. And what 
tremor is, is a leaking of the signal from the brain to the muscles, particularly in the arms and the hands. And so that static, in a sense, leaks in and it tells the muscles to move like this. And you can't do anything about it. Now, what they sometimes did would run a needle into the hypothalamus and burn a hole in it. But that was very invasive. They had cut a hole in the skull and you, how, how you got it at the right point. But now you're doing imaging with an MRI. You can find exactly where the hypothalamus is. You know exactly where that, that little, almost a bean size, even smaller than a bean, a pea maybe. And you, what you do is you turn on HIFU for just about one or two seconds and you see a light. You see the collar. Maybe it's green, and not red. It's green. It means it's 39 degrees. And oh, that's not the right place. You move it a little bit. So he has this helmet on his head with 1,200 or maybe even 2,500 transducers. And you can go through the skull. It's a very difficult problem. We could talk about that, how you do that. And you go through the skull and you say, I got the right point. One 15 second burst, the hand stops. It's incredible. The hand stops. They have done 20, 30,000 patients. And I'll tell you then how many things that you've done. This is how many high food treatments are used, focused ultrasound treatments are used. And you can't read that, so I blow up some of these things. Bone metastases was one of the first things. That, what's bone metastases? You have liver cancer, you have breast cancer, you have prostate cancer, then you get metastases. Where do they go? They go to the, the, the not to the bone, but the, Model, what's inside the bone? Marrow. 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 Marrow on the bone in a hurt like hell. And so what you do is you treat the nerves that are from the tumor and you destroy the nerves. You no longer have pain. You're not curing anybody. You're, you're just doing a prophylactic sort of way. And that's approved now by insurance companies. These are People treat it, and then these are different levels of, of, of advancement. These are approved for treatment, but not approved for insurance. And if you're not approved by insurance, you, you, you can't do it unless you pay $20,000, $30,000 for the treatment. So those are musculoskeletal. These are neurological. Central tremor, tremor is approved. And... Uh, Parkinson's disease. Michael Fox is a big contributor to this. It's on the board of this Focused Ultrasound Foundation. And they're approved for treating the, the jitter and the shakiness in Parkinson's disease. And some of this kinesiology goes with kinesia, uh, whatever the word is. And other things here uh, uh, OCD and ADHD. My, 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 well, not there's none. Uh, and a uh, lot of things, uh, traumatic brain injury. What else? See? Look down here at the bottom. Uh, oh, they're treating depression. I see some depression was on there. And uh, Optimont. Well, first one that was approved was uterine fibroids. I was on the FDA review committee for this. And I was enthusiastic about it and everybody says wait a minute you know yeah this is this is so new you don't know anything like that but it's approved tens of thousands of people of women have been relieved of uterine my wife had uterine fibroids it was just terrible for her and um, prostate cancer believe it or not prostate cancer is approved there are 895 companies treatment centers, treatment centers. So they have the two or three of them in, in uh, Seattle, 192 in the US, but look at this, in Europe and in Asia, in Asia and China, and these are all, almost all in China. You can do anything in China uh, in a few months if you've got a new technology. Okay, that's uh, the background in, in the sort of the general information. 
Now I want to talk about acoustics for a while and, uh, and tell you how we've, we, our lab, and basically uh, people like Julie and, and uh, Vera Koklova and so forth have developed technologies that are replicate this and use this sort of idea. So if you have a sound wave propagating at high amplitude, then the trough goes a little bit slower than the peak and this wave stiffens up, straightens, tries to, to, to tighten up. And as a result, if you do an FFT on that, you get a lot of harmonics. And the great thing, important thing perhaps, is that the absorption is dependent upon the, on the frequency. And so even though the uh, amplitudes are not that much different, the axial intensities are not that much different, look how much the heat deposition is because these high harmonics here are very absorptive. And if you were to say that I'm gonna raise the temperature to 60 degrees or something like that to perform a, 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 a temperature of thermal lesion, you gotta be careful because you might be boiling because you don't take into account. That's why acoustics is so important. Nonlinear acoustics is so important in the things that you do here. Here's a specific application, 35 megapascal P plus and 11 megapascal P minus. And so if you do, this is sort of an argument for learning nonlinear acoustics. If you do a linear prediction of what the temperature would be for a 40 millisecond pulse, you get five degrees. If you use weak shock theory, the dissipation of temperature rise is proportional to A to the third amplitude of the third power. And with this sort of parameters, you instead of expecting five degrees, you get 80. Got to know nonlinear acoustics to do this. And so Vera and Julie and other people have worked on what are the conditions and so forth and how do you control those conditions. And so this is uh, a particular case, we're going to heat, we're talking about heat right now. And we'll look at different cases of amplitudes, 440, 40, 40, 80, and uh, millisecond of time. It's sort of a dose type thing. And let's look at 12,000 watts per square centimeter. What, when would you expect boiling? And this is in a gel. And at one millisecond, this is a uh, fiber optic probe, about two millimeters in diameter. And now you can see that but there's cavitation. See that, Jake? And then at eight milliseconds, that might be boiling. You predicted it would be in, uh, what is it down there? Seven milliseconds. And at nine milliseconds. That's how good nonlinear acoustics is. If you did it with just linear acoustics, you, you might not expect any boiling at all. And you're good within a millisecond. Okay. Uh, now, this is the point where uh, a, a great, I think, discovery was made in, in uh, our lab by Erica Klofa and, and uh, with participation, people like Julie and so forth. Vera said, if I want to get, let's suppose I want to get boiling. There'll be a reason to understand later. Suppose I want to get boiling. Now, if I make the focal length exactly equal to the shock propagation distance, that is, this thing's going to shock up and suddenly it gets shocked, then you dump all the energy in the system at the focus. So you could get a boiling in tissue right at the focus in a very short period of time. Why would you want to do that? Well, I'll explain later. But if you do, 10 milliseconds, you can get boiling. And look what happens when you get in the tissue. You get erosion. If you go a little bit longer, 20 milliseconds, you see this white thing here? That's thermal denaturation. And if you do 500 milliseconds, then you get a lot 
the thermal, but inside the middle here, it's all liquefied. Why would it be liquefied? Here's another example. You got Transduce here, you're focusing on this thing. These are numbers all over the place and not so important. And you can, by changing the various parameters, get these tadpole-like things in which the tissue inside is all liquefied, emulsified. And then as a function of various peaks and so forth, you can get, you can sort of plot out the parameter space. Now, uh, Tanya Koklova, who is the daughter of Vera Koklova, had her uh, had an opportunity to use some clinical systems to do this. And so she did some prep first about what are the conditions for getting this boiling. And so she took a mouse or a rat and you, what you do is you inject a tumor uh, uh, cells underneath the skin of the rat. It makes a tumor. And then you treat that tumor with high food with a pulse like this. And you get liquefaction, liquefaction. So now, why would that be important? And why do you get liquefaction? So this is where Julie came in. Julie was asked, what would happen if you took this pulse that Vera said was going to produce uh, liquefaction in five milliseconds or something like that? What would happen if it hit an interface, a, a liquid air, air water interface? Explosive effects. This is a water, this is an acoustic fountain. So if you hit an interface, an air tissue interface, you're really going to blow up the inside. And this is a, a great picture that you, Julie did. And she published that in Journal of Fluid Mechanics. It's a first rate journal, of course. And that's a hole in liver. And she exposes this uh, to the, 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 the uh, um, boiling histotripsy pulse and magnifies the effect. It just shoots the tissue in there and you have jets shooting out and there's no living cells inside because you just obliterate the tissue, liquefy the tissue. So basically what Vera and her colleagues have, have determined is that if you have high food and you shoot it in and you can get thermal damage, if you increase the temperature very quickly, so you get above 100 degrees, you get a vapor cavity formed. And then when the pulse hits the interface, you get essentially jet formation, breaking up the interior of that system. So Tanya did this with a, uh, a clinical HIFU system. Uh, this is Phillips, I think. Anyway, we have a clinical HIFU system in Seattle and we were allowed to use it. And so we did experiments with this thing. And uh, she was shooting into tissues here like this. And this is just sort of background stuff. I'm not sure this is all that important, but in, a, in, in, in a, an experiment in which she wants to see how fast you can get and how rapidly you can get in a, in a tumor model. There's a rat there. And, uh, and what she was looking for, and this is really important, and let me just take a moment to explain this. So, and this is my son-in-law, who didn't know it all, but he's an MD, PhD radiologist. He says, don't explain that, it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, this way. This is, this is not right. I'm telling you, it's not correct, but I want you to have an analogy. Uh, what happens is when you get the COVID-19 COVID vaccination, in COVID, the, uh, there is a, a, a spike protein, and the spike protein connects to the cell. 
And the great thing about the spike protein, it's a, a key. It opens up the cell. The virus goes inside the cell, doesn't kill the cell, and takes over the cell machinery and makes a million, maybe even a trillion copies of the virus because the virus is only a, 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 a nanometer in size and the cell is maybe a millimeter in size. And then it bursts and now you've got millions and billions of virus. The trick is not let the spike protein open up the door. So what you do is you put in an mRNA vaccine and it sees the spike protein, creates an antibody. The antibody puts a sheath over the spike protein. The spike protein can't get in the cell line. That's what vaccines do. So it takes a while for the immune system to build up that antibody. So that's, that's how COVID works. But what's happening here, what you've done is you've taken a tumor, let's say we're treating a tumor, and you blast the tumor inside a hole, and now you have a liquefied region, no living cells. But the tumor is different from normal cell tissues. It has an ant antigen. That means it's a different genetic material than, than, than the normal body. So the immune system throws in all kinds of leukocytes, which is uh, T cells and stuff. And they start looking, hey, there's a new area here, what's going on? And it's like a mosquito bite. You get some, some, some stuff into your, your body from, from a mosquito, immune system come in and says, oh, that's bad. And they turn on the inflammation thing. So what you have is an inflammation. It itches because it's an inflammation. That's the immune system responding. Well, the immune system then goes in and looks at these antigens, says, aha, this is an invader. Let's do something about it. Now I'm going to talk about what they do doing that. But they are, you, what you're doing is you're almost, again, this is incorrect. You're kind of vaccinating the system for this tumor. And you're going to try to learn how to treat that tumor. So Tanya is trying to learn that and what the steps are and so forth. And so she plots this out. Now this is the tumor. She emulsified the tissue in the interior of the tumor. This is a normal cell and it got all kinds of uh, red blood cells and things. And now she looks in this region here, there's nothing. There's no red cells, there's a border here. So this is nothing but liquefied tissue. Now, to do a controlled experiment, she wanted to see if you just heated it. And you can compare this with just normal thermal heating. And then you can do it with this Philips Healthcare experiment, uh, which is now a commercial system. And you do it inside an open MR system. So she now can control the temperature in her rat. And she can then generate this liquefaction. You can't really tell it there, but you wash away the liquefied regions and you have that there. And then you look, well, by the way, what's really neat about uh, um, the boiling histotripsy is that the tissue is liquefied. If you do ultrasound imaging, then this area is different in elasticity no elasticity hardly in, in the liquid part. And it shows up on an ultrasound system. You don't need to use an MR to, to visualize it. And you see that if you use mild heating or a control here, you don't get the response of the immune system. That's what this is looking at in various uh, micro antigen type things. And then this is here, here the kind of the killer is that uh, Shenzhou, they have invented cavitation histotropes and they have carried it a little much further than uh, Vera and her team is in boiling histotropsy. And if you look at treatment of a mouse and you treat the primary tumor, this is a primary tumor 
and the contralateral tomb. This is really an important slide because you train the immune system to look for this antigen. What's the antigen? Well, it's the thing that teaches the immune system to look for the tumor. And the tumor is self-contained, not liquefied. And quite often the tumor hides the antigen from the immune system. But you taught the immune system to look for the antigen. And what happens then is that it go looks for the tumor. If you treat the rat with or a mouse with a primary tumor, and you don't do anything else, or no, it's to do the control first. You give it this insertion of cancer cells, and then you follow through. And after a while, not only do you have this big tumor underneath the skin, but you have metastases. Metastases. Metastases are the thing that kills you. If you have breast cancer, you're not going to die from breast cancer. Sorry. Let me say it again. You're not going to die from cancer in the breast. What happens is the tumor metastasizes, goes to your lungs, goes to your liver, goes to your brain. That's what kills you. You even get it in your, your uh, legs and your bone marrow, and that's very painful. What you die from is the metastasis. That's why they stage it as one, two, three, and four. Two is it's, uh, outside the capsule. Three is metastasized. Four, the metastases are around the body. You got stage four, you're in trouble because you got metastases around the body. But if you do have metastases in your lungs and your liver and your brain, and the immune system can go find the metastases as it did here, you reduce those metastases. This is, this is a remarkable discovery when you think about it. This is saying that advanced stage cancer is not lethal if you can make this work. It's difficult to make it work. It works in rats. And people are trying to find out whether it works in people. Here's taken off the internet of how complicated I'm gonna I'm gonna push the whole thing here instead of doing it stage by stage I'm gonna do it this way and then I don't know how I don't know how to explain this stuff because uh, there are Nobel prizes in some of these steps here so you got a tumor cell it's got an antigen in it and a dendritic cell is a T cell it sees the antigen it, let's it, here it is. And then it goes to a, 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 a sort of a maturation and migration and you get a T cell and the T cell then develops a receptor. And then there are other things here that are sort of dead in. And then that T cell has this recognition of the antigen and it activates killer T cells. The scalar T cells go around and look for that antigen and then destroy it. It works in rats. Uh, whether it's going to work in people, uh, a good friend of mine, Bob Apfel, died, he was 55 or 56 years old from renal cell carcinoma. And maybe it was 19, 2002, 2002. He's going to die. It's a long time ago. And he actually went to Germany and they took his tumor that had metastasized and they chopped it up in a blender and they injected it back into his body, hoping that this would trigger the immune system to go kill the metastases. It did not have enough time. This takes time. And, and that, that is the biggest issue. But histosonics, which is the Michigan group who started cavitation 
is the trypsy, which is the same sort of in general, it's just a different mechanism. It's cavitation that breaks up the cells rather than boiling and this liquefaction that Julie understands. And they have also one of their, I don't know, uh, objectives is to look at the immune response to treating liver cancer because they want to see if they have immune cell activation and whether there is some reduction. Many of these people are already in stage four. They're going to see if there's any activation and, and, uh, and attack of the, uh, of the metastases. So I went to Egypt last year <laughs> and the guy said, I said, one of my things in life is to ride a camel in front of the, in front of the uh, pyramids. That's, that's, that's me. And I went to see the hieroglyphics and the tombs. I didn't see this thing, but this is an Egyptian hieroglyphic and it has scalpels here, all the kinds of tools. The Romans had all kinds of tools. They were doing surgery 6,000 years ago. They weren't very successful. <laughs> but there are mummies with holes in their scalp. And I think that probably they had a migraine. And they thought, well, we'll cut a hole and that'll let the stuff go out. My daughter is a surgeon and she's an optical surgeon. And she does, removes tumors from the optical nerve, which means she has to take the eye out, go in and take the tumor off the optical nerve without damaging the optical nerve, put the eye back in, sew up things. And she's done that hundreds of cases. And she uses a scalp. Scalpels were used on me when I had an appendectomy. They're used now as minimally invasive systems. They put an endoscope in there and they do this. And now they've got da Vinci robots and the robots do the surgery with control on the outside, like, like a game control. But now we can do it all. We can do it all non-invasively. And we can watch the immune system respond to that. If we teach the immune system, the most powerful pharmaceutical company in the world, the most powerful to treat a uh, disease that our body has spent 20, 100,000 years developing. So that's uh, what's available for you young uh, students preparing your career and so forth. I won't be alive to see the implementation of this, but you will. And maybe you'll save your children by inventing something that will treat advanced stage cancer. Thank you very much. Most people don't want to ask questions and so forth. This is a discussion session. And one of the things I'd like you to think about at the end, because you're young, some of you are not so young, but nonetheless, you probably have good ideas. What happens if you have AI in the system? You got this person in an open magnet, MR, and you see everything. And you have a tool that can do things from the outside. From the outside. You could teach it to start examining the tumor, you can see how, where its volume is. You can teach it that after you've done a thousand of these, how long do you have to, to apply the, the tissue, apply the, the, the hyper? This is non-invasively means you can scan the whole body. You could take an MR and a CT and scan the whole body, give it to an AI system, look for bad things. It would find them because it would compare your body with a million other scans, maybe a trillion other scans. And it would say there's a 93% probability that you have 
a tumor in the pancreas at stage two. That's five years away. My son-in-law is a neuroradiologist and he looks for tumors in the brain, among other things. And I said to him, my gosh, Edward, somebody is going to get an AI system that's looked at every scan of the brain with an MR and a CT that there is, and they'll do it in 15 seconds. And they'll say there is a 92% probability that little spot there that you wouldn't have noticed is the first evidence of a tumor. He says, I know, I know. I'm not coming me on business. I'm writing the machine language. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, that's enough. Come on, Jake. Who's <laughs> <laughs> Eric? Eric was going to talk, ask me a question. Anyway, yeah. Um, for the um, kind of immunotherapy to work, where you're talking about how um, the histotripsy breaks up and then it goes around, the immune system is able to then react and go around the body. Is that something where the person has to go off of like immunosuppressants for that to work? Because I know a lot of cancer treatments, they're um, required to go on immunosuppressants. I, I don't know how to answer that. I would think that you wouldn't want to go on to immunosuppressants because you want to activate the body's immune system to look for that energy. I mean, that's my straightforward answer, but I don't know enough about you know how you, these things work and so forth. But that's a trick. That's a uh, you know, there's a, a dilemma there. The thing is that what's difficult to do in medicine is change the protocol because physicians get sued all the time because they didn't follow the standard protocol. The Europe, and, and the, come on, I, I'm not a fan of the Chinese political system, but I am really a fan of their science. They say we've got 4 billion people and they're all going to 1.4. And they're going to die by millions of this. We can afford to do some bad science or some bad medicine to discover things that will say, lots of other people. The FDA was so scared from thalidomide, if the young people don't know that, the thalidomide thing, that they want never to make a mistake. And that's why there are 400 uh, centers in China, 300 in Europe, compared to the 200 we have in the United States, because the FDA is not gonna approve. I could have shown you what is approved by uh, Europe, we call it CMAR. 10 times as many things are improved in Europe in the CMAR that are approved in the FDA with the PMA, pre market approval. I'm not ultrasound engineer. <laughs> um, so, looking back at the transducers that are used to manufacture the high through signals, you know, back from the original single. You know, crystal type of large diameter sensor, you know, transmitters to the arrays that they have now, you probably still use some of that same technology. What technology do you see coming in the future for high food generation? It means people looking at CMOTs or other type of apparatus to create it in a better controlled environment, uh, you know, with more control. Yeah, I had a meeting with Susan Waterer in April yesterday. She's a real expert in developing piezo machine ultrasound transmitters, mm -hmm. P nuts, P nuts, and, and, and uh, she's saying there are lots of advances we're going to make. One of the things that you have when you make an array is you, that you have, uh, if you if you bigger than a wavelength, you have these. Uh, refraction, you have like this side lobe, side lobe. Yeah. <laughs> but what you can do is you make them very small so you get less than a wavelength and you can do away with a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. Had a project with scenes, it was funded by DARPA. They spent almost $30 million trying to develop a system that would stop bleeding, and that's a whole other lecture and so forth. But they built a, a an array that was the size of a piece of chewing gum. 
6,000 elements. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 6,000 elements. Yeah. I don't have any side lobes. That's it. And, they put, yeah. and they put an ASIC on the back and sent a signal, one signal, and it went this way, that way, here. Very quickly. Very quickly. And so the capability of building these arrays now it's already there. It's just that can you make a machine in which you you need to have that much capability? We're really talking about not not that much capability needed because you've got MR and you're looking at a spot that may be a centimeter in size. If you hit that, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. You're going through the skull, that might be a problem, but there are ways of doing prime reversal and all that sort of stuff. You get rid of all of the aberrations going through the skull. Mm -hmm. There are this focus ultrasound has data. There are over a half million people treated in the United States alone by these focused ultrasound systems. And the existing technology is available. It's where they want it. Now, of course you could do, instead of having to go inside an MR, you could just do it with ultrasound. Don't have to do the MR. Mm -hmm. Now this, uh, 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 sort of boiling hysteropsy allows you to guide it with ultrasound, but still MR is the, the way to do it. But what's really important, I believe it or not, and I don't need, need to sound political here, but it's the FDA who won't approve it for insurance reimbursement. So all of these things are available to treat uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and so forth. Maybe not that's the best example because that's approved, but to treat other things like tumors in the brain, tumors in the liver, not approved. So you have to pay for it or the company has to pay for it. And why would the company pay for it if, well, they pay for it because they're hoping to get approved. So the, the biggest retardation, if that's a word to this, is the fact that it's not reimbursed. And these companies are limited by how many clinical trials they could do and how much they spend. And the fact that it's not reimbursed, Phelps made a, a system, Siemens made a system. Only the Israeli and Cytex system is the one that's approved and the only one that's used. And the big boys, Phillips and Siemens and whoever, they're not going to get into the game until they start uh, approving it for, for uh, uh, reimbursement. And so I was on the FDA committee and I said, let's think about the cost here to do a hysterectomy on a woman that has a, a uterine fibroids. It's kind of a difficult thing to do because it's usually two to three weeks, the woman is just out of the market. And there are all kinds of morbidity associated with that. And there's bleeding and all that sort of stuff. And what you're going to do is you're going to put this person in a magnet and you're going to take maybe an hour and you're going to focus and on and cook some of the things and she can walk out of there without any anesthesia. Why wouldn't that be a better thing to do? And the vote was, I think, eight to six. And we won by eight to six to approve uh, uterine fibroids. And once uterine fibroids got approved, then the other things kind of fell on line. But, you know, I, and, 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 you know, I'm not going to say the FDA is not a good thing. I'm just going to say that it retards the advancement of this technology so much so that, well, I'm, that's enough. <laughs> Obviously, I got to think about that. You were going to ask, Jay, come on, what, what's the hype? What's the nonlinear aspect of it that interests you? Oh, what's the non, uh, interesting aspect of uh, nonlinear uh, shocks that uh, would interest me? <laughs> well, you know, if it wasn't for Mark Hamilton and David Blackstock and so forth that learn how to do weak shock theory and be able to give this available to someone you just put in the amplitudes and the frequency and so forth. Do you know what, what, how much, how many harmonics you're going to get out of? You then 
unless you did weak shock treatment, you don't know what the absorption is going to be. You can do it all, you know, experimental, and, you know, and work from just results. But if you can calculate what intensity, what amplitude, what your focal length is, what your time is, immediately you can calculate when am I going to get boiling. And that, I think, is very important. You know, and, and it's people who worked for a long time. Isn't that part of what we try to do? We build a foundation so that other people can use what we've done to, to expand the system and make it apply it. I'm sure David Blackstock never thought of weak shock theory he was going to enable Vera Kaklova to build boiling histotripsy system. This is what's great about your research and about all research in general. Any other last questions? Oh, uh, any of the students or anything or anybody else wants to talk. I'm, I'm not leaving until five o'clock or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Dr. Tom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 